Alexander the Great's life spanned only 32 years, but generations upon generations of scholars have been fascinated with him ever since. He conquered most of the known world, and his influence on geography and politics existed for many centuries. Before his mysterious death, he was revered as a god. In our day, he is reviled as a mass murderer. He's the subject of a movie released last month, as well as the latest work from Professor Guy Rogers. Professor Rogers holds his PhD in classics from Princeton University and has, has received numerous grants and fellowships. His first, his first book, The Sacred Identity of Ephesus, Foundation Myths of a Roman City, won the Rutledge Ancient History Prize. His latest work, Alexander, The Ambiguity of Greatness, is already being praised as balanced and authoritative, learned, lively, and brilliant. Please join the Classics Club in welcoming <laughs> Professor Guy Rogers. I want to uh, thank Alana Clare uh, and the Classics Club for inviting me to come and talk uh, at Wellesley today uh, about one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's nice to be back in Wellesley, if only for a couple of days uh, at this point. Uh, next term I'll be back uh, teaching full time. Uh, haven't been here in a while, so um, hope the semester has gone well for everybody. I think um, it might be worth saying something about my motivation for writing this book first. Most, for most of the last 2,300 years or so, um, Alexander the Great has been seen as a kind of hero or even a god. In fact, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, a famous uh, British scholar named William Tarn uh, more or less overtly compared Alexander to Jesus. In the second half of the 20th century, however, a different sort of scholarly trend evolved. A much darker view of Alexander was taken by several scholars who either implicitly or explicitly compared Alexander to Stalin, to Hitler, and most recently, Cortez. So basically, um, recently, Alexander has been rechristened as Alexander the Terrible or as Alexander the Insignificant, because another part of this new scholarly consensus about Alexander is that although he conquered an empire which stretched from Greece to India, after he died, the empire fell apart, and therefore he really didn't do anything. So they've denied, actually, that he has any real legacies at all. Now, I've been teaching courses about uh, Alexander at Wellesley for about 15 years, and um, I've had a lot of time on my hands uh, to think about the reasons for this major change in the way uh, one of the largest figures in history is seen by scholars. And I think that there are two reasons uh, worth talking about however briefly. The first reason is a good reason, and that is that scholars now have devoted a lot of time and energy to understanding the sources for Alexander's life. We have a much firmer grip on who wrote about Alexander and the reasons why they wrote what they did about Alexander and his legacies. And so a lot of the myths have been stripped away, and we have now got a much better grasp of what it is that Alexander really did himself, as opposed to what was embellished or elaborated by historians. The second factor which you have to take into account is the context in which the views of Alexander himself were being propagated in the second half of the 20th century. Some of the most prominent um, uh, historians of Alexander were people who had uh, written their articles and subsequently their books in the long dark shadows cast by Stalin and Hitler. And so therefore it wasn't completely surprising that when they came to think about Alexander and how to interpret his actions, uh, they had at hand um, some fairly compelling um, uh, figures. And so uh, the Alexander that emerged at the end of the 20th century 
had more in common with a, a mass murderer or an ethnic cleanser than the hero or god uh, whom he'd been likened to earlier on. So what I set out to do was to actually go back and read through all of the ancient sources. And although it's very unfashionable uh, to attempt to do so, to try to present a fair, clear, and balanced account of Alexander based on his actions. And that's really the critical point. None of us knows what went on in Alexander's head. Because Alexander, like Jesus, never really wrote anything down that we know of. All we can do is judge Alexander by the actions which we can identify as his, given this uh, better source critical account. So the result of my analysis is, uh, with the incredibly uh, sensational title, Alexander the Inferred. Um, Alexander the Inferred is neither gay nor straight. He's neither a mass murderer nor a mess messiah. What he is, rather, is an ambiguous genius, a prodigy of warfare, who defeats our polarized and polarizing modern categories. He is, in the Greek word, aniketos, which means invincible. He can't and will never be defeated by simplification. Now, Alexander's story is an epic story. And for those of you who have sat through uh, almost three hours of Oliver Stone's Alexander, you will realize uh, that epic doesn't even do, begin to do justice uh, to the story. In fact, it, that movie could have gone on for a much longer time. And today, in just a few minutes, I really can't do any justice at all to the uh, breadth and the depth of the story. To get that, you'll either have to buy the book, which is relatively cheap, or take the course, which is relatively expensive. <laughs> but to try to understand something about Alexander, what I'd like to do today is to say a few things about Alexander's context, both his historical context and also his personal context. And then I will pick out a few events and trends in Alexander's life. And I'm going to try, actually, um, to say something about why Alexander is still important. As I was writing this book, my sister in New York kept telling me or asking me, why is any of this important? Um, she's right. Uh, historians have to try to think about why it is that anybody should turn the next page. So in an effort to get you to turn even the first page of my biography, I'm really going to try to relate this story uh, selectively, uh, implicitly and explicitly to a lot of what's going on in our world uh, today. The historical context. And this is something that uh, I find incredibly puzzling but very revealing about prior biographies of Alexander. I really don't think that people have done justice to the fact that Alexander belonged or in some ways came at the end of a long historical struggle between the Persians and the Greeks, especially for the coast of Asia Minor, roughly the west coast of modern day Turkey. The Persian Empire, for those of you uh, who have forgotten taking world history in seventh grade, was the largest and most successful empire in the long history of empires of the Near East. And in the last 25 years, fantastic scholarly work has been done on the Persian Empire by scholars like Amelie Court and a French scholar, Pierre Briand, in uh, Paris. Uh, whose book um, is about three times as long as mine uh, and is far more dense. Uh, so if you think 1,800 footnotes uh, is something to brag about, you should read Mr. Briand's History of the Persian Empire. Um, it is the authoritative account. And he has brought the Persian Empire in all of its diversity and grandeur to life. 
On the other hand, it's also important to remember that the Persian Empire was not a charitable foundation. It was founded by force of arms, and that's the way it was maintained. I think, unfortunately, there's a tendency to try to romanticize peoples about whom scholars have not paid quite as much attention as they have to the Greeks and the Romans. So that's one important piece of background information. The most important event in this struggle between the Greeks and Persians for our story was the destruction of some temples up on top of the Acropolis of Athens in 480 BCE, which was accomplished by the Persian king Xerxes. He marched over to Greece with a big army, and they burned down the temples on top of the Athenian Acropolis. That act was seen by the Persians as the fulfillment of a directive from their main god, Ahura Mazda, who really wanted everything to be well settled within the empire. The Greek point of view was that this was the greatest sacrilege in human history, and actually an oath was sworn at the time to punish the Persians for that sacrilege. Very little could be done about that by the Greeks at the time, although they drove the Persians back across the, um, the Eastern Aegean to Asia Minor itself. There was never a real serious attempt to actually punish the Persians in Persia itself. That was undertaken or planned actually by Alexander's father, Philip II of Macedon, on behalf of the Greeks in the 330s. After Philip's assassination in 336, it was Alexander who took over that war of revenge against the Persians. So that is the broad historical background to the Alexander conquest story. Now, I want to say a few things also about Alexander's personal history, which I think are important as well. And for those of the students who may have taken the Alexander course at some point, they may remember that I usually ask this course by, I start my course by asking them to think a little bit about some of the differences between Alexander as a young child and your own background. So with Alexander, his father was a king, and many people thought that Philip of Macedon was the greatest king in Greek history. His mother was a princess, Olympias, um, who, it turned out, was a very, very uh, politically savvy, strongly motivated woman in her own right. Alexander's tutor was uh, Aristotle, uh, the greatest philosopher in Western history. I, often at this point in class, I say to the students, and you have Professor Rogers as your tutor, <laughs> which actually points out the contrast in the starkest possible terms. <laughs> Most importantly for us, though, Alexander grew up in a culture where warfare was accepted as the natural state of affairs. And I cannot stress this enough. Alexander grew up in a place where since the beginnings of Greek literature, warfare had been the focus of some of the greatest works of art, let alone political engagement. And so from the very earliest ages, Alexander was trained how to fight. Now, we know these things about Alexander, and but I also think that there is something more to Alexander, and I've been asked um, a lot about this lately. And when I was trying to write the early chapters of this book, uh, trying to account for the fact that someone could turn out to be so good at something at such an early age, I began to read biographies of other geniuses. And the one that I found uh, paradoxically the most compelling was a recent biography of Mozart. Uh, Mozart also, of course, was a prodigy, although obviously of music. But he seemed, from the time he was even three or four years old, to be adept at an art uh, which many people uh, find very, very difficult to approach, even at a rudimentary level. 
So I began to think about the analogies between great composers, great writers, and somebody like Alexander. And I really do think that uh, genius has to be explained by a combination of genetics and environment and then preparation. And there's no doubt whatsoever that Alexander was prepared and pushed by both of his parents, not only by Olympias, but also by Philip, um, to achieve, as he put it himself, something great and uh, spectacular. So that's his, that's his background. Now, I can't talk in detail about the course of the War of Revenge, which took place from 334 to 323 in Alexander's death. All I can do is to give you a kind of broad outline, which I hope will give you some idea in turn of why Alexander is universally considered to be a military genius. And also, I hope to suggest a few things about uh, Alexander's example, which may be still relevant. And I should say that even the people that consider Alexander to be um, uh, a Hitler-like figure or a Stalin figure concede that he either is the greatest military genius in world history or right up there um, in the first division. Now, in fact, there were two wars. The first war took place between about 334 and 331, and it was characterized by big set-piece battles that Alexander and the Macedonian army fought against the Persian armies of King Darius III. Just to give you sort of uh, uh, orders of scale, the Macedonian army was comprised of about 40,000 combatants that he brought over to Asia with him, around 32,000 infantry, maybe five or 6,000 cavalry. Ultimately, the Persian army was at least 10 times that large. And one of the most striking things about reading the scholarship on the Persian Empire by these very distinguished scholars of Persia, such as Briand, is that at the end of their accounts of Achaemenid Persia, that is, Persia of this ruling dynasty, the question that they stop with is, how could this possibly have happened? It was impossible impossible. An army one-tenth the size of a million-man army ultimately ended up defeating that army on the battlefield. And in fact, uh, to my knowledge, Alexander is the only general we know of uh, who also fought it at the front of all the battles and never lost a battle in his lifetime. So this has puzzled historians. Why did he always win? I can only uh, talk briefly about one example, the, the first example, the first uh, battle that Alexander fought against the Persians in the spring of 334 uh, after being in uh, Asia for only a few days in what's now the sort of northwestern corner of Turkey. The Persians had arrayed their army on the east bank of a river which is about 30 to 40 feet wide, and in the springtime actually runs at about a depth of three or four feet in the deepest places. Usually, uh, in military doctrine, you don't try to attack a force in a strong defensive position, which the Persian army was on the east bank of this river, across a natural obstacle like a running river. Why? Because, of course, it, it, the river itself is a strong defensive line, and obviously the Persian idea was that as Alexander and the Macedonians charged into the river to get up the steep banks on the other side, the Persian cavalry would ride down on them using their superior cavalry. The Persians had great cavalry, and the momentum of the cavalry charge would break the Macedonian line up so that the Macedonians couldn't attack effectively. Within, literally, hours of his arrival at this battle scene, Alexander figured out that he had to bring the Persian cavalry down from their positions set slightly back from the bank to 
take away the advantage that they would have of the momentum of their cavalry charge. So what he did was he sent a lucky group of his soldiers into the river and the Persians, thinking that this was their big opportunity to smash this 20-year-old before he really got going, uh, sent their cavalry down into the river, at which point Alexander attacked into the river itself with the Macedonian cavalry. And essentially what took place was a sort of infantry cal uh, battle, but fought by cavalry, and the Macedonians turned out, uh, in this instance, to be better fighters, man per man. Military historians, in looking at this battle and other battles of Alexander, have characterized his tactics um, as being those of somebody who, if chess had been invented, would have been a great chess player at the time. In the Battle of the Granicus, which I just described, they call this the pawn sacrifice. He sent some people across to be sacrificed, but of course, they undermine the momentum of the Persian attack. I'm using this example to point out something about Alexander. Alexander had an incredible, a natural ability to read the topography of battlefields in relation to the forces that were arrayed on both sides. He was a problem solver of the first order on battlefields. And I could multiply the examples with the other big battles, but we uh, don't have time. So he was a great military tactician. He was also an incredible strategist. He had a strategy for conquering this immense Persian empire by coming over into Asia and piece by piece dislodging from the grasp of the Persians their western provinces, the places which roughly today would correspond with uh, Turkey, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Egypt, thereby depriving the Persian king of the revenues which came from the provinces, these rich provinces, which he needed to pay his largely mercenary army. Now, lots of armchair historian, armchair generals of the 20th century have said Alexander was uh, a terrible strategist. He should have gone to Asia Minor and marched right into the center of the Persian Empire. Thereby, of course, uh, giving himself hugely long supply lines, which he never could have maintained, and also running the risk, of course, of being attacked at his rear. Um, what I say about this is that people think that conquering the Persian Empire was an impossible task. This is something that he did in only a few years' time. It's a little bit like saying that Edmund Hillary should have climbed Everest, but by a different route. Um, this is the standard by which uh, military strategies in the ancient world are uh, judged. Now, there are, in fact, lessons from Alexander's tactics, logistics, and strategy, which are still discussed by very serious military historians, which relate to this first war. I, I can't get into those lessons right at the minute. Uh, and also, they're not as interesting, I think, as what I'm going to have to say um, about the second war. After Alexander defeated uh, Darius at the third big battle of Gaugamela, uh, for those of you who have seen Oliver Stone's movie, it is the big battle which is uh, depicted where Alexander makes his famous uh, stirring speech. That took place on the 1st of October of 331. After that, shortly after that battle, Darius was murdered by some of his own officers, who then because they could not defeat Alexander on a battlefield, took off into the eastern provinces of the Persian Empire. And so what Alexander was forced to do was to follow them out east into what is today Afghanistan, part of Pakistan, and also into Central Asia itself. In these areas, these rebel generals, they were called rebels by Alexander. They considered themselves to be nationalists. They mounted an insurgency campaign against Alexander using hit and run tactics. 
So Alexander had to adapt his tactics to those of his adversaries. How did he win this campaign? Um, there are two points worth making. First, he had to divide up his forces. Instead of fighting in one big battle group, he divided up his forces and attacked all of the rebels simultaneously. And most importantly, most importantly, because the rebels would attack his forces and then escape across the rivers in, of Central Asia, giving the rebels aid and comfort, Alexander found ways of putting extreme pressure on the allies of the rebels in the neighborhood. The result was that within three years, all opposition was systematically crushed. Now, I think that there may be more things to say about that, and perhaps uh, during the question period, um, someone can convince me to get into trouble uh, about uh, the way that he fought that counterinsurgency campaign. But what I really want to talk about is something which is far more important, I believe. And that is that Alexander seemed to understand that even the most ruthless tactics on the battlefield could not bring about strategic victory. Strategic victory he defined as being accepted by these people as the legitimate ruler of this vast empire. And so what Alexander did, actually from the moment that he began to replace Darius in 331, was adapt himself to the customs of the Persians themselves. He started wearing Persian clothing. He, adapted, he adopted the court ceremonial of the Persian kings. He incorporated Persian officers and soldiers into his army and also eventually married into the, uh, the Persian royal line. And at this point, I think I want to segue a little bit and talk a little bit about Alexander's sexuality, because I know um, from uh, reading the press about the Oliver Stone movie that this is a topic uh, that people are interested in. And so I thought, in the interest of uh, clarity, um, that it might be important to say a few things about this, and then we'll come back to the narrative before I uh, finish off. The first thing to understand here is that all of our modern sexual categories, homosexual, heterosexual, gay, straight, uh, don't work for the ancient world, uh, certainly for the Greek world of the fourth century. The terms themselves didn't actually exist. We have a tendency to try to slot people into sexual categories. That was not true of the ancient Greeks by and large. In other words, if the Greek god of desire, uh, Eros, impelled someone to be attracted to either a man or a woman, and that man or woman acted upon uh, that um, desire, it did not mean that they were then locked into a particular sexual camp. So that's the first thing to understand. So once again, I think that the way to look at Alexander's sexuality, given this different way of understanding sexuality in general, is to look at his actions. That's all we, that's all we have. Our sources tell us that, and this is, this is a remarkable uh, piece of information, given the interest in Alexander um, in this regard. Our sources tell us that actually, when he was young, Alexander wasn't interested in sex of any kind. In fact, his parents purchased the services of a courtesan named Calixena, a prostitute, to liven him up a bit. <laughs> we are not told what the outcome of this was. However, another late second century source tells us 
that a woman named Pan Caste, who probably also was a courtesan, was the first woman with whom Alexander had sex, which may mean that Olympias and Philip did not get their money's worth out of Calixena. So that's his early history. We know that by the time he reached Asia Minor in 334, that he had a close relationship with this fellow, this officer in the army, this man, Hephaestion. Now, Hephaestion is a somewhat uh, controversial figure. Uh, we don't know lots about him, but it probably is worth saying that uh, what we know is that he was taller than Alexander. He was apparently handsome. And he achieved some of the highest positions in Alexander's army through Alexander's favor, despite what many consider to be a quarrelsome nature. And there's one beautiful little anecdote where uh, after Hephaestion argued with a fellow officer named Perdiccas, Alexander is quoted as having said, doesn't Hephaestion know that he's nothing without me? Um, which may tell you something about Alexander's view of their relationship. He also was known, however, as the dearest of Alexander's friends. And unlike the rest of Alexander's friends who supposedly loved the king, Hephaestion was said to have loved Alexander himself. And it was that love that seemed to have formed the basis of their relationship, although, as one contemporary source did put it, Alexander was never defeated except by Hephaestion's thighs. Most scholars have interpreted that comment as meaning that they had a uh, sexual relationship and that Hephaestion was Alexander's lover. Um, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I'll leave it for you to decide. Whatever their relationship was, however, after Alexander's second major battle in 333, he took on as a mistress a beautiful Persian woman named Barsine, by whom he subsequently had a son named Heracles, an indication that Alexander's feelings for Barsine were not completely platonic. After the decisive victory at Gaugamela, we also know that Alexander took over Darius's harem of 365 concubines. Diodorus Siculus tells us that these concubines had been selected from all the women in Asia on the basis of their beauty, and that every night these beauties paraded around Alexander's tent so that he might select the one with whom he would lie that night. Later, when he was in Bactria, roughly Afghanistan, he met at a party a young Bactrian woman named Roxanne, whose name means little star in, Persia, in Persian, and he fell in love with her, we're told, at first sight. She was said to be the most beautiful woman in Asia after Darius's wife. And we know that she was pregnant with Alexander's child when Alexander died in 323. Alexander's most controversial relationship was with a young Persian eunuch named Bagoas. There's a famous incident after Alexander came back from India where Bagoas took part in a competition, a musical competition, which Bagoas apparently won. And after winning, he walked across the theater and sat down next to Alexander. And the Macedonians there cheered and called for Alexander to kiss Bagoas. And uh, eventually, Alexander did kiss him. Some historians earlier in the 20th century have denied that this incident even took place. Uh, it can't have happened. But in fact, it probably did happen. What it signifies about their sexual relationship is a little bit less clear, but certainly there were historians around in antiquity who believed that they did have an erotic relationship. Finally, after he returned from India, Alexander married the two daughters of the ex-Persian kings, and we know that Alexander uh, wanted to produce offspring uh, from, these, uh, from these marriages. So just to summarize this little segue very quickly, Alexander actually did develop a number of relationships of some depth 
with Hephaestion, with Barsine, with Roxanne, and possibly Bagoas. It's notable that all of the, or most of the relationships that we know about were with people who had been gifted by the gods with beauty. Remarkably, however, unlike many of his Greek contemporaries, as a beholder, Alexander did not see beauty through ethnocentric eyes. Indeed, casting his eyes over the captive Persian women after the Battle of Issus, Alexander is said to have jested that the Persian women were a torment for the eyes. So Alexander wasn't really gay, he wasn't really straight. He is ambiguous and he cannot be put into any of our modern categories. Now, shortly after those uh, marriages to the two Persian princesses, Alexander began to plan the conquest of the rest of the known world. And the reason why it's important to say that is that many historians have looked at Alexander in 324 and said when he got back uh, to uh, Babylon that he was a broken man. He was wounded in battle eight times. Um, his, his boyfriend slash friend Hephaestion died of some kind of fever and he had fallen apart and gone a little bit uh, mad. Unfortunately, the sources don't uh, support that moralistic story. What we know is that in the few days before his death, he was planning in great detail the uh, conquest of the Arabian Peninsula. There's a nice little anecdote about this, that he had heard that the Arabians only had two gods whom they worshipped, and he thought it might be appropriate if they added a third himself. <laughs> After Arabia was going to come North Africa, and after North Africa, Europe as well. The scary thing is, is that he wasn't a broken man, and it was going to go on and on and on. However, at a party, a drinking party, roughly two weeks before his eventual death, after drinking toasts, of unfortified wine to 19 of his colleagues. <laughs> Alexander is what we call in Connecticut a great drinker. After drinking toast to 19 of his colleagues, he either came down with a fever, which eventually killed him, or by another story, his soldiers, who were very tired of marching, after marching 10,000 miles 10,000 miles out to India and then eight or 9,000 miles back decided they had had enough. And with the help of his former tutor, which is a lesson to you all, <laughs> with the help of his former tutor who procured the poison, Aristotle, he was poisoned and at the drinking party cried out as if stuck in the ribs with a um, a dagger. Which of the stories is true? We really don't know, but it's worth mentioning that most of the poisons that we know about from the ancient world, like hemlock, acted very quickly. So it's probable, in fact, that Alexander died of a fever, and it suits the environment as well. And lots of different possibilities have suge been suggested by scholars, including malaria, um, um, all kinds of parasites, um, all kinds of things. You have to remember, of course, that this is a guy who, for the better part of a decade, had been fighting at the very front of these armies and had suffered many serious wounds, um, had, let's say, an active social life and also was drinking very, very heavily for months, if not years, on end. So he died, um, actually, on the 10th of June of 323. And now I'll just close by saying a few things about um, Alexander's uh, legacies. 
Many of the historians who have written about Alexander in the, in the second half of the 20th century have claimed that he died, his empire broke apart, and therefore he accomplished nothing. In other words, Alexander was like a comet. He blazed across the sky for a very short time, he burst, and he was gone. And all that was left was mythic vapor. This is probably the most astonishing example that I know of of the way in which all, can, all history is, in some sense, contemporary. Because many scholars don't like how it was that Alexander created this world, which I'll talk about in a minute, they have simply said it didn't exist afterward. These, however, are the facts. In less than 10 years, Alexander and the Macedonians overthrew the largest, most successful empire in the history of the Near East. Before Alexander's time, there were two little trading ports where the Greek language was spoken on a day-to-day -day basis in all of the Middle East and the Near East. After Alexander, because he was founding cities and military garrisons all the way from Egypt, the first Alexandria, to Central Asia, Greek became the dominant language of all public expressions of law, military affairs, and even religion, which I'll come to in a second. So, in other words, it would be almost impossible to, to overestimate the, the change that he brought politically, militarily, and culturally to the Middle and Near East. The fact that he died and that his generals, like Ptolemy, the, the narrator of Oliver Stone's film, the fact that his successors could not successfully put Humpty Dumpty back on the wall that is, couldn't reconstitute the entire empire, does not mean that there was no influence over the long run. What happened was that the successor kingdoms with their Greek culture, and now for the first time, Greeks and Macedonians living side by side with Egyptians, with Syrians, with Jews, in all of those places, when they were conquered subsequently by the Romans, down to the time of the last of these wars, which ended the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt, the famous Cleopatra's death scene, what that meant was what grew out of it was an amalgam civilization in the Near East, a Greco-Roman civilization. Culturally, culturally, and in many ways, in terms of religion, because the Greeks and Macedonians brought all of their cults with them as well, Greek. At the top level, militarily, diplomatically, Roman, but even the Romans using the Greek language. The Greek language became the language of the Middle and Near East. Until that time, it had been, by and large, Aramaic, actually. That was the language of communication within the Persian Empire itself. Out of that, so that's the medium term effect of Alexander. The long term effect, however, is I think even more profound. You have to realize that it was within the borders of this amalgam civilization that all three religions of the book, rabbinic Judaism, what we know as Christianity, and also Islam, either were born or evolved, either in opposition to the religions which Alexander brought with him, so sometimes in contact, but sometimes in conflict with that religion. Now, what this means is that the monotheistic traditions were born in a context in which this amalgam Greco-Roman civilization was the focus of all public affairs 
and also even the expression of religious ideas. People perhaps should ask themselves how it came to be the case that all of the books of what we call the New Testament came to be written and disseminated in Greek rather than Hebrew or Aramaic. Or to put it another way, what would have happened if the New Testament had been written in Hebrew or Aramaic? How far would it have been disseminated throughout the ancient or medieval world? So, the case that I'm making is that Alexander, in many ways, was the decisive architect of the world which gave rise both to the civilizations of both the Middle East and also Western civilization itself. It wasn't exactly how Alexander planned it. Um, there is a story that Alexander, at a famous oracle in Egypt, asked whether he would conquer the whole world. And according to this story, the answer was that yes, he would. Today, there are billions of people worldwide who belong to these monotheistic traditions which were born out of that contact and conflict with the inhabitants of this civilization that Alexander helped to create. And I sometimes wonder whether the fact that Alexander in some sense has conquered the world, but a very different kind of world than he anticipated would have uh, given him uh, some joy. So, thank you. Okay, so, who's brave? Fortune favors the bold. Yes? Can I just say a few words about the application to the present day? Oh, no. the, the application of, can you be more specific at all? present war. That's a big question. You don't want to ask. No, 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 it's not, it's not that. I, I try to be I try to be careful about distinguishing the um, the first war, the, the set piece battle war from the counterinsurgency war. The set piece battle war, uh, those tactics are studied by people, but but excuse me, I think under the circumstances that the counterinsurgency campaign um, is something that uh, people are actually looking at, for not the least of which reason that it's being fought, or at least one of them is being fought, in exactly the same place that Alexander fought it. And while um, there's a difference between um, carrying a Macedonian pike um, and um, a rifle with a laser on it, um, the topography is, is the same. And some of the problems that Alexander faced are, are the same. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, Mike. You were saying that uh, his real genius was uh, in, in military strategy, but then at the conclusion you were talking about the, the cultural and religious uh, legacy. Was part of his genius in, uh, in even militaristic terms and conquering uh, the peoples he conquered? Uh, cultural and religious. How much of the idea of spreading Greek as a language, how much of the idea of spreading Greek religion over uh, Persian religions uh, was his? Or is that? It wasn't that he wanted per uh, Greek religion to replace Persian religion. He actually let everything just stay in place and people continue the way that they wanted. The best way to explain it is, um, and thank you for the question, is to um, relate the, the story that when he was in Egypt, he supposedly went to a lecture um, by a professor type who was going on and on and concluded with the insight that Zeus was the father of all mankind, by which I take this guy to have meant that Zeus was the father of 
Greeks, but also since he was talking to a Greek and Macedonian audience, that he was the father of Persians and Egyptians and everyone else. So he was sending out a message to Alexander. We are told that Alexander's response to this was that Zeus was the father of all mankind, but he made the best especially his own, which is a line that could have been written by Homer. It comes the idea comes directly out of the Iliad. And so, to get to your question, I think what this means is that as he went along in the Near East, what he discovered was that not all the best at anything were Greeks or Macedonians. And he found, he realized that he needed these people to accomplish what he wanted to do. So there was a pragmatic and practical side of it, but it was theologically grounded for him in a way that, that I find uh, both profound and actually moving as well. Uh, it's, mo it's moving not because it's anti-egalitarian, which it is, because it implies that there are some who are the best and there are some who are not the best. But for another reason, we also are told before he made his way over into Asia, that his tutor, Aristotle, advised him to treat the conquered peoples of his empire like plants and animals. And Alexander obviously didn't quite do that. And this is why, this is why in my book, I claim that he is, in some sense, an, an anti-egalitarian multiculturalist. He believed that it was possible that some of the people living in the Near East could be the best as well. And they were the ones that he was going to use to help him achieve his goals. So I'm not saying, I'm actually not saying that he was more of a genius um, at military affairs than at religio-cultural affairs. What I'm saying is that the, the genius comes, as it were, through this, from the same font. It's just that people, everybody agrees that he's a military genius. And I should say, I should have said, that acknowledging that he's a military genius do, is not the same as, as saying that uh, killing tens of thousands of people, which he is responsible for, is a good thing. Um, just to be clear about that, okay? Professor Parler, yeah. You mentioned uh, Cortet. Uh, was Alexander in any way like Cortet in reliance on regular groups from the empire and his armies entered to acquire new allies among those who wanted to throw off the Persian Empire? Yes, and the question itself sort of reveals something about uh, both the, the, uh, the positive side of using analogies and then the, the negative side. The negative side, of course, is that um, uh, as far as I know, the Aztecs had never sort of sailed over uh, the Atlantic and attacked Spain, whereas uh, the Persians had. Uh, so that seems to me to be a rather major flaw with the analogy. Um, Analogies are, are instructive and useful so far, and so far as they illuminate. Um, I actually think that the historical figure with whom Alexander is most aptly compared is, in fact, the founder of the Persian Empire, this guy Cyrus the Great, because Cyrus was a very charismatic character. He killed a lot of people. Um, he built his empire by force. Um, he, too, used... Um, some of the uh, indigenous peoples in his armies, um, and, um, and also he had a good publicity machine working for him as well. Some of the brave students, students? Nah, students are not brave. No, go ahead, yeah. You know, it's, it's a sort of mixed review. Um, some of the, some of the Roman emperors, like Trajan, for instance, who did get to the Persian Gulf, stopped at the Persian Gulf and were told, said, if I were Alexander, if I were younger, like Alexander, I would go further. The problem was is that he was sort of a middle-aged old guy, you know, and that was it. So he couldn't go further. He was, he was known and remembered by them as a great conqueror. Um, 
he sets a rather high bar um, if that's what your life ambition is. Go ahead. Whoops, I'm sorry. First, and then... Me? Yeah. Okay. What about the religion thing? You talked about that just a little more, how a polytheist and a, uh, someone who's involved in a polytheistic Greek, or Greek religion could be the... You know, could create in contrast to what his religion was and spreading Greek culture with its religion, then could create the great monotheistic traditions. Could you could just say a little more about that. He didn't create them. I mean, what happened was that what I'm saying is that in all of these cities, the, maybe the best example to take is Alexandria, the first city that he founded. That city was um, literally, uh, the area was uninhabited when he founded the city. He brought into the city some Greeks and Macedonians, but also were told people from the countryside. Almost all of those people that we know about were polytheists whether they were Egyptian or Greeks or Macedonians. Eventually, however, of course, Alexandria became a, uh, a city where literally thousands of Jews lived and eventually had a large Christian population. There were both contacts among these people and also conflicts among them. But actually, Alexandria is the place where the Septuagint was translated into Greek and then disseminated out to the Greek-speaking and Greek-reading population. And without, without Alexander founding it as a fundamentally Greek city, that never could have happened. So it's not that he founded um, a monotheistic tradition. It's actually up against his polytheism that the monotheists, as it were, were banging their heads uh, for several centuries before the Roman Empire in the fourth and fifth century was Christianized at the behest of the Roman emperors. So it's a, it's a contact and conflict model rather than uh, what he had in mind. He had in mind Zeus's empire. He had in mind that all over, all over this map, if he got what he wanted, all over this map, the best of us would be in charge. And the rest of us, you know, um, we could live there, but we would not be in charge. Yeah, go ahead. So one of the famous anecdotes that I remember about Alexander is his uh, deathbed answer to the question, who do you leave your empire to, the strongest. But I've also heard people say that that was actually sort of a, uh, a mumbling. He was saying the name of one of his his generals, and that in Greek that was very similar to the word strongest. And right, Craterus, to Kratisto. That's one story, but there are many stories about Alexander's deathbed. I mean, we all should be so lucky. Um, <laughs> there are many stories of his, of his last sayings. Uh, you're quite right. There is, it's a double ambiguity, in fact, like everything else with Alexander, because it could mean to the best or to the strongest, because Greek is ambiguous about what, the, what that means. But it also might be Craterus, um, who was one of his favorite officers. My favorite saying, however, is that <clears throat> um, just before his death, some of the Greek city-states had um, uh, decided that they would institute cults for him. They would worship him. Uh, which is another, a whole other topic, but it is there. This is not mythology. They put in place cults to actually make sacrifices to him because he was very powerful, just like their gods and goddesses. He could make big things happen. I mean, this is a big thing, <laughs> much bigger uh, than he claimed himself that it was better and bigger than anything that somebody like Dionysus did, for instance. It was, modesty was not his strong suit. So, so he supposedly was asked on his deathbed, when should we sacrifice to you? And his answer supposedly was, when you're happy. <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing. Of course, it's probably apocryphal, but whoever wrote it, you know, deserves a star. So, somebody else had their hand up. Yeah, Ludwig, sorry. I was just very interested in, in the Greek language. Yep. You know, because obviously it becomes the lingua franca and then Arabic. That slips into part of that much later. And so there is really no expansion of Greek until he takes it 
to, if the artist is interested in, is it all his empire, or is there a little bit already, maybe in a, in a trader, trade diaspora, or? It, yeah, uh, it is, uh, it's a good question because it allows me to clarify what I was talking about a little bit. Before, before 334, outside of Asia Minor, roughly where Turkey is here, in the Middle East and in the Near East, all the rest of the purple, there were two places, one at the mouth of the Orontes River in Syria and another here in the Nile Delta at a place called Nocritus, where there were Greek trading colonies that had been there since about the 6th or 7th century. Greek was spoken there. Everywhere else, it's all indigenous languages, and the, the language of... Um, of commerce and communication officially within the Persian Empire itself was not Persian, but was Aramaic. So, so in other words, other than these two little islands, there is nothing. After Alexander, gradually, and the successor kingdoms, in all of these places, while it is true that we do find caches of inscriptions written in Aramaic, a lot in Hebrew. Hebrew is the exception because we know that Hebrew continues both as a written language and also as a, um, um, as a language of documents, whether it's inscriptions or papyri, right throughout into the, into the medieval world. It's the exception. In all the other places, Greek supplants these other languages as the, as the public languages of um, expression of thought. The best example that I can give you is that in the early third century, so roughly mm, maybe half a century after Alexander's death, in the 1960s, archaeologists, 1970s, archaeologists working in Afghanistan found two inscriptions composed for a local king in Greek expressing the fun, some of the fundamental tenets of Buddhism. So Buddhism reaches the Greek world in Greek, okay? <laughs> because, because Alexander was in Afghanistan. That's the reason. And that's really what I'm saying, is that this provides um, the, the opportunity for an exchange of ideas all kinds of ideas across cultures, which was impossible before. Impossible. Yeah, Gary. Given his ego and something what he accomplished, why didn't he write down more? Why didn't he dictate more of his own thoughts and about his actions? I mean, the sense of history or... He brought, he brought, well, like most of us, he wasn't anticipating his death. Uh, but, but... But he brought with him a, um, a historian, a, an official court historian named Callisthenes, who was a kinsman of Aristotle's. And Callisthenes is one of the most interesting figures in the whole, in the whole story because it's obvious that from the, from the bits of Callisthenes which we have embedded in later Roman era sources, it's absolutely obvious that Callisthenes' line on the whole thing was that Alexander was a second Achilles. That's, that was the spin of the story, that like Achilles, he was going over to Asia, he was this great conqueror, and all the rest of it. And then one day, then one day in Afghanistan, Callisthenes walked in, and there Alexander was, dressed like the Persian king. And he was you know, asking his Macedonian soldiers to bow down before him like the Persians did. Whoosh, script just went right out the window, you know? And, and eventually, Callisthenes and Alexander came into severe uh, conflict, and no one, uh, no one who ever came into conflict with Alexander emerged. Um, <laughs> So that was, that was the end of Callisthenes. Um, and the script got changed, actually. And, but it's, I don't want to be too um, facetious about this because it has two very important effects. One, when you read these sources and read what Callisthenes has to say about Alexander before his demise, he is absolutely invaluable 
When you realize that, Callisthenes never could have written anything and have it pass muster unless it was pleasing to Alexander. So by a sort of back door, we do get what Alexander wanted people to believe about certain events. Okay, So that's absolutely critical. But the second important point is that Callisthenes becomes the sort of Socrates figure around whom all of the anti-Alexander historians of the Roman Empire rally. Alexander was a tyrant. He got rid of poor old Callisthenes, who was standing up for freedom of speech and this anti-Persian thing. But here's the deal. Think about this for a second. What Alexander, in some way or at some level, was standing up for was the idea that the Persians were not plants and animals. So what they turned against him was that he was not ethnocentric enough. And that legacy continues to this day. You find it in the, in the writings of historians, I mean, to last year. And even, I mean, I actually was uh, pleasantly surprised, let's say, by the Oliver Stone movie because there are certain things about this story that uh, I hate to tell everyone Oliver Stone got right. Uh, and that's, that's one of those, one of those parts of it. Um, last question, maybe? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the Persian army was about a million men. At the, at the, at Gogamela. Would, would, would those million men be scattered across the empire so that in a given battle, the odds might be two to one, three to one against the Greeks? Or do you think they would mass ten to one against a given battle? Exactly. Um, they were spread out throughout the empire. It took years to assemble them all. We have to sort of cleanse away everything about the modern world, um, which, uh, you know, the speed, the communications, all that's gone. This is a much slower world. It took him to the Battle of Gaugamela in 331 to really assemble everybody, to get everybody together. And um, they had an ethnically incredibly diverse army. There are arguments about how many of them there were there, but everybody believes, all the historians believe, that the Macedonians at Gaugamela were outnumbered at least 10 to 1, at least, maybe by 20 or 30 to 1. The solution to that problem, for those of you who are uh, interested in these tactics and the chess playing, was that the problem for Alexander was that when you're surrounded, when there are a million guys facing you and you're only 50,000, uh, you've got a little problem with envelopment. Um, so what he did was construct a hollow rectangle. That was the way the, he arrayed the army, which could fight forward, backward, and to the sides. And, and actually, another thing that Oliver Stone got right was that at, uh, the Persians had scythe chariots, which drove into the line. The Persians were so afraid of the Macedonian cavalry that they constructed these special scythe chariots. And what the Macedonians did was they sent out some really sort of crazy brave guys uh, after the chariots as soon as they started charging. The ones that made it through, they actually just opened up their lines and had the grooms and special guards envelop the chariots on the inside of the hollow. That chariot, I mean the, uh, the tactical hollow, uh, was as far as we know a, an innovation at the time. It's, it's amazing. That's why I said that when I was reading about this stuff and I was trying to figure out how it is that somebody who's in his mid-twenties can come up with this stuff. Uh, where does that come from? Um, in the end, because I'm not that clever, uh, my word is that it's ineffable. It trying to explain how it is that Mozart uh, could write the music that he did and write so much of it uh, when he's in his teens it, you, you can't finally explain it. You simply have to, at some level, accept it. One last question. Somebody had their, somebody had their hand up. Yeah, okay. Um, and you mentioned that, that um, was the name, that name? Yes. Uh, identified Alexander with Achilles. As he moved east, did he identify with other local heroes in that same way? Great question. Absolutely. Yep. Um, lots of local heroes, um, but Alexander being Alexander, of course, we're talking about full-time competition uh, with all the greats uh, from Greek history. He was related through his mother to Achilles, and he obviously read the Iliad uh, when he was a child. We were told that Aristotle 
annotated a copy of the Iliad for him, wrote little comments, you know, the way professors are, they write those things in the margins, explaining, you know, the reading of stuff. He took that with him all the way to India, and we're totally stuck with that, and a, a dagger under his pillow uh, throughout the campaigns. But he did compare himself not only to Achilles, but also, very modestly, to Dionysus and Heracles. Um, and he claimed to have outdone both of them. Anyway, okay. See, I could go on for hours, but I'll let you go.